to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 24. Welcome to our study of the home as God would have it. Today, our homes are struggling greatly in America with the problems that arise in the family that sometimes occur. Divorce, sin, the consequences of worldliness. The home desperately needs God's guidance and God's help. And so in this series of lessons, we're thinking about what does God say in the Scripture about the home that will help it to be a godly home that will grow godly children and that will help each of us to get to heaven. As always, we encourage you to visit our website at thegospelofchrist.com. That's thegospelofchrist.com where we have a host of Bible study materials that are available free of charge. You can access those by downloading them or we have an option where you can request a free CD or DVD. We'll even pay the postage to get that to you. As always, we want to encourage those who are listening. If you've got a Bible study question, if you'd like to learn more about the Bible, please contact us through our website or at the information that will be given at the end of this lesson. Today, specifically, we're dealing with the problem of divorce and remarriage. What does God say about marriage, divorce, and remarriage? This is indeed a very, very serious problem. Some statistics show that nearly half of all marriages are ending in divorce. And then what does the Scripture say about those who are divorced entering into another marriage? Well, to better understand God's teaching on marriage, divorce, remarriage, it, we just simply need to look to those scriptures in the Bible that teach what we need to do about that and then apply our lives to that teaching. The first is all the way back to the beginning of creation. Genesis chapter 2 verse number 24, God's teaching in the original plan for the home and marriage is one man, one woman, leaving father and mother for life. Listen to the words again. The Bible says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they, the two, shall become one flesh. What's God's original pattern and plan for marriage in the home? One man, one woman, leaving father and mother, making their own family unit, and here's what you don't find. You don't find multiple wives. You don't find one man and one man or one woman and one woman. You don't find that. And you don't find divorce or that marriage ending for other reasons. God's original plan and pattern in its purest, simplest form is for husband and wife to marry for life to bring godly children into that home and to help one another strive to live a godly life and indeed to go to that beautiful place called heaven. Well, as we further think about God's plan for marriage, divorce, and remarriage, we, and His laws for those, we must learn, though, that the Scriptures do teach about divorce. I want to direct your attention to Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, where the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ discusses divorce and the only scriptural reason for that. In His Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will say in Matthew 5, beginning in verse 31, Furthermore, it has been said, Whoever divorces his wife, 
let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality or fornication causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. What's Jesus trying to teach here? Well, the Jews had heard, you've heard, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. That was the that was the way they had corrupted the teaching of Moses in Deuteronomy 24 and some of their rabbis had taught that and so their idea was if you want a divorce just hey, give her a certificate of divorce and be done with her. What did Jesus say? No. Whoever divorces his wife, Jesus said let me tell you God's law. Whoever divorces his wife save for, except for fornication, sexual morality, literally the Greek word is pornea, illicit sexual activity. And remember, the only licensed place for that is in the marriage bond, Hebrews 13, 4, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except fornication commits adultery and causes her as well to commit adultery. No doubt the remarriage idea entering into that as we'll discuss later. But what's God's law? Except for fornication. God has not licensed marriage, divorce, or divorce and remarriage. Now, I want you to further notice what Jesus says about this. In the same book, Matthew chapter 19, look with me if you would in verses 1 through 12. That's Matthew 19. We'll actually begin in verse number 3. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses, listen to this now, command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? Jesus said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. The Jews, again, had some misconceptions. They start with a question. Can a man divorce his wife for just any reason? Some of their rabbis said they could. Some said they couldn't. And so they come to Jesus. We've heard your, about your miracles. We know you know the law. What's your answer to this great question? Can a man just up and divorce his wife for any reason? And Jesus takes them back to the original plan. In the beginning, from the beginning, it's not so. God made man and woman, brought them together to be a family unit, and there's no idea in that teaching of divorce. And so God's original pattern is what Jesus holds up. And Jesus says concerning divorce from the beginning, it was not so. It was not a part of God's original plan. Well, the Jews then have another question. Why did Moses, and watch their language, command to give a certificate of divorce. Command, Jesus said, wait a minute now. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. From the beginning it was not so. What's happening during that time? Well, as we'll think about a little later, in that context there seems to be just the putting away of wives and taking new ones and, and that seems to be a, a problem then. And so for the protection of the women, Jesus, Moses allowed to give a certificate of divorce, but he permitted it, but that was never a command. It's never as though you have to do this and this is licensed. It was already occurring, and so there was some control of that for the protection of women there, but Jesus goes on to say, from the beginning it was not so. Now listen to Jesus' words here, though. Verse 9, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her is divorced, commits adultery. What exactly is Jesus trying to teach in this context? Well, first of all, Jesus taught 
that if you divorce your wife, and it's not for fornication, and marry another, you commit adultery, and whoever marries that woman who was divorced for reasons other than sexual morality commits adultery. And so there's only one, just one now, scriptural reason for divorce, and that's sexual immorality, fornication. And then and only then, in the scripture, is the innocent party given the right to remarry. Now, make it practical. Let's say that if two people are married, and those people are in a scriptural marriage, and one of those mates has an adulterous relationship with someone else, and the innocent party, although he loves his wife, although she loves her husband, decides that they're going to do that, they can't be trusted. Do they have a right? Not a command. It's not, we're not saying you have to. We would hope and pray that even then we, people would strive to work it out. But do they have a scriptural right to put the guilty party away and remarry? Yes, but that's the only party and the only reason in the scripture for which that can be done. The guilty party has no license to do that within the bounds of scripture. And so the only reason for divorce in the New Testament under the law of Christ is for fornication. And then and only then does the innocent party have the right to remarry. Again, we stress that even under situations like those, we ought to try to make it work out. We ought to try to rebuild that trust. If at all possible and the person is penitent, even then one ought to strive to work toward a godly marriage in a godly home, if at all possible. We then want to think about a third passage which teaches that fornication and the act thereof is something that can be lived in. And this goes along the teaching of some who say that, well, adultery is not something you live in. It's a point in time action. You can repent of that and not be lived. Jesus said, yes, they're going to commit adultery, but you can repent of that and still stay in the marriage. Friend, we want to address that idea by showing then in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, the scripture actually teaches that fornication, which would include the sin of adultery, is not just point in time action. That's something that one lives in. Notice the words of Paul to the church in Colossae in Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 5, as he discusses the idea of adultery and how one can live in that sin. The Bible says, beginning in verse number 5, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, and watch this, fornication, which is inclusive of adultery, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which as idolatry, because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked, watch this now, when you lived in them. These sins are not just point in time. Some will say, well, adultery is point in time action. You can repent of that sin and remain in the marriage. Not according to Colossians 3, verses 5 through 7. If someone is in an adulterous relationship, it's not as though you can repent of that and remain in it. For the scripture says it's something that you live in. Can a person live in adultery? Absolutely. If adultery is a sin you can live in, then friend, to repent of it, we must do what God says to get out of that ungodly marriage and ungodly re relationship. We're going to look at this a little later as well, but in Ezra chapter 10 verse 3 and 4, God commanded His people to, put, to get out of those ungodly relationships. They were commanded to put away they're ungodly spouses. Let's think then for just a moment about how God really feels about divorce. I want us to think back to Malachi chapter 2, verse number 16, as we find out how our Father, how God the Father, really feels about divorce. Notice the scripture, Malachi chapter 2, verse number 16. The Bible says, for the Lord God of Israel says he hates divorce, for it covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. God, how do you really feel about divorce? God says, I hate divorce. Why? It covers one's garments with violence. You know, when we 
We think about violent crimes related to the family or the relationship in the family. We think of maybe domestic violence, spousal abuse. We think of, of rape or we think of some other violent crime. Do we realize that divorce is a violent event? You think about the trauma, physical maybe, emotional, psychological, spiritual. You know, it's as though today you can get a divorce for two or three hundred dollars, put that behind you and be done with it. Friend, it is not at all that easy. There is baggage. There is emotional scars, psychological and spiritual. Th think about in a divorce where there are children. How do children feel about that event? Well, I can assure you to them, it is a violent event the tearing apart of the home, the tearing apart of father and mother, the splitting of all that, the having to go different places, and that's a violent event. And God says, I hate divorce. Friend, the things that God hates, we ourselves ought to hate. And in so doing, here's how that ought to help us. We ought to strive, if God hates this, to never let it happen and to make sure that we're working toward having a godly and scriptural marriage. I want you then to direct your attention to another passage. Deuteronomy chapter 24 discusses divorce under the old law. And in the context of Jesus' words in Matthew 19, this would be what the Jews were referring to. Notice Deuteronomy 24 beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. When she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, the Bible says if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, how's that person to feel about that? Or if the latter husband dies who took her as wife, then her former husband who divorced her, the Bible says, must not take her back at, to be his wife after she's been defiled. For the Bible says that is an abomination before the Lord and you should not, God says, you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. When we think about Deuteronomy 24, here you've got a context of a man finds some uncleanness in his wife. And because of that, he's allowed to give her this certificate of divorce. Friend, it's very likely that that uncleanness could be sexual immorality. Let me illustrate. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 8 says this. God said, Then I saw... For all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. You know, from Jeremiah 3.8, I learn that when God gave Israel a certificate of divorce, it was for adultery, which very likely could be the uncleanness sexual uncleanness, sexual morality mentioned in Deuteronomy 24 as well. And so here you've got this idea that if a wife commits some uncleanness, uncleanness and her husband finds that in her, he can give her a certificate of divorce, put her away. But she's not to become some other man's wife or if she does, her husband can't take her back as well. That would be an abomination on the land and would actually be known as God talking about that concerning sin. And so Deuteronomy 24, and yet Jesus, when he thought about Deuteronomy 24, when he was asked about it, do you remember what he said? From the beginning, it was not so. It was allowed so that the Jews who were already doing it, so that women could have protection, so that it could be regulated. But friend, from the beginning, this was not part of God's original plan. Jesus said, because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses permitted it. But from the beginning, this was not so. Let's then think about a situation where two people find themselves in an unlawful or unscriptural marriage. What must they do to really repent? Well, some would say that if two people find themselves in an unscriptural, adulterous situation to repent, they just need to say they're sorry. 
Now remember, Colossians 3 verses 5 through 7 says adultery is something you live in. And so is just saying we're sorry and repenting of that what's required? I want to direct your attention to the book of Ezra. Ezra, post-exilic writer after the time of the exile, has to deal with problems relating to the Jews and some of their sin related to marriage. And so in Ezra chapter 9 and 10, here's what's going on. The people have married heathen wives. God told them don't marry the ungodly heathen women. Or don't take up relationships with them. They did anyway. And so here, the context is the Jews are in unscriptural marriages to these heathen wives. Well, how did God tell them to repent and deal with that? Listen to Ezra chapter 10, beginning in verse number 3. The Scripture says, Now therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those who have been born to them according to the advice of my Master and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter is your responsibility. We also are with you. Be of good courage and do it. To those in unscriptural marriages, God said, put, a, put away your wives. They're to do this according to the commandment of God. They were unscriptural marriages then. What about unscriptural marriages today? What about two people who enter into a, maybe a second marriage where neither one had the right to remarry? What must they do to repent of that? Friend, just like in the days of Ezra, so today, repentance demands putting away, getting out of that sinful relationship. Jesus said, or John did in Matthew 3 verse 8, that people need to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Real repentance demands a change in one's life. If someone's in an adulterous relationship and that's something you live in, then just saying, I'm sorry, is not repenting. You've got to stop the sin. The sin is the relationship itself, which is contrary to the teaching of Christ. Is that, is that difficult? Is it challenging? Absolutely it is. But friend, to obey the will of God, one must stop living in that sinful relationship and to live right with God, they must get out of those sinful actions. Let's then turn our attention to another passage mentioned by the Lord and Savior in Luke chapter 16. And, and this passage of Scripture relating to divorce just simply reiterates the law found in Deuteronomy chapter 20, chapter 2, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 24. Listen to Jesus' words in Luke chapter 16, verse number 18. Jesus said, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Remembering Genesis 2.24, that it's one man and one woman for life, Jesus said whoever divorces his wife, based on those ideas, if you divorce your wife, you're committing adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Again, we know that there is the scriptural reason of fornication, but Jesus just has in mind those who are not doing that, those who are divorcing just for any reason. They're committing adultery, and they're causing the one they divorce to commit adultery. And so when we think about Jesus' words, let's realize that marriage is indeed a very serious command, and only those who obey the will of God and do as God says can live in harmony with his teaching. We want to emphasize one other principle related to divorce, and that has to do with the idea of marriage lasting until death. I want to direct your attention to the words of Paul in Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse number 1. In Romans chapter 7, Paul is dealing with the old law and how that Christians those today are dead to that law so that they can be married to Christ. And he uses marriage as an illustration, and indeed we can learn a lot from that. Notice Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by law to her husband, as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband, so then 
if while her husband lives she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she's no adulteress, though she's married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you've also become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be buried to another, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God." The basic principle here is, since the old law is dead and you were married to it, you can now be married to Christ. Well, what do we learn about marriage there? While one's mate lives, if they marry somebody else, they're committing adultery. Now, if that mate dies, they have a right to remarry, and thus the basic principle again of marriage lasting for both partners until death do them part. Friend, as we think about the idea of marriage and as we think about the importance of it, with the great struggles that the home is facing today, what practical lessons do we learn? Friend, marriage ought to be a very serious decision that two people enter into striving to please God and to help one another get to heaven. Well, what about divorce? We ought to think of divorce as not even being an option. Is there a scriptural reason? Sure. Fornication is the scriptural reason. But two people enter into marriage ought to just say to themselves, we're going to make this work no matter what. Can people remarry only the innocent party for reason of, of fornication? And then and only then. That's the idea that God taught. There's not 101 reasons for divorce. And yes, people who enter into marriages People who are divorced, who enter into marriages and they don't have a right to divorce, they are living in adultery. And to get out of that, they must get out of the marriage to repent and really live faithfully in God's sight. And so God's laws are very serious and very strict and we must have a soberness in entering to that decision. As the writer said in the book of Psalms in the long ago, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Let's let God's law govern our marriages so that our marriages will please Him in every way. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. God be the glory, this is the gospel of Christ.